Hello, everyone. How are you all this afternoon? Doing well? Enjoying the conference? Excellent. It's lovely to be here, so thank you, everyone, for inviting me. So I'm going to be talking about the web. And there are lots of reasons to love the web. For me, it's the scale. It can reach users all around the world on almost any device. And the only thing they need is a browser. It's easy to use, and it's easy to share. There's nothing to install, and it's an open ecosystem that anyone can use or build on. But you know, for a long time, there were many claims that the web was dead. For example, Wired magazine, back in 2010, said the web is dead. Long live the internet, though. But the web was only 18 years old at the time, so it was really just a teenager. It's a bit unfortunate. This conference, I think, very much proves that the web isn't dead. The issue back at this time was that people were noticing and documenting that apps had started to take up more, that more of people's time than web does. And that led to headlines back in 2014 like this. Mobile app usage increases as mobile web surfing declines. The web is dead. Long live the app. The decline of the mobile web. And the web is dying, and apps are killing it. So what was happening? Well, it was all to do with time spent. And this is the kind of thing that was reported. This is updated figures. And today, only 12% of the time that people are on their phones is spent on the mobile web while 88% of it is spent in native apps. And this study was by Comcore, Comscore, and other research companies find very similar stats. And as you might well know, the reason for this is because people are spending their time in certain sorts of apps. So it's to do with social networking, music, games, multimedia. And this is why that time stat is prevalent. So these things are entertainment or communication focused. Maybe it's not time that matters. So while it is indeed a great deal of time that people are spending in apps, it's not evenly distributed across verticals. They found stats like this back in 2014 too, although these ones are the, the latest ones. Um, back when all these headlines were published. But when people started looking at this more closely, there were some telltale signs that mobile web had some great things going for it too. They found that mobile web accounted for more traffic for many verticals, more than for many mobile apps. For example, this chart, this was from 2015, so it was a year later than all those headlines were published. It shows that retail, finance, insurance, and travel typically see a 50% or higher proportion of their visits from the mobile web. This resulted in Wired changing their tune. The web is not dead after all, and Google made sure of it. And this rep was reporting about the advancement of activities that can be done in a browser, and the early successes of progressive web apps. In fact, some use cases are really ideal for the web. Luke Chatelain, who's the chief innovations officer, I've always wanted a job title like that. I think it's awesome. <laughs> He's the chief uh, innovations officer for West Elm, that furniture company. He made this point when he stood on the stage last year at Google's retail conference to explain why they'd created a progressive web app rather than a native app. And he said, well, people don't buy a couch on their phone every day. So another way of saying this is understand user behavior and do what's right to meet your users for your business in a way that will help them best. So in order to make the web better, we've been developing progressive web apps. So let me tell you a little bit about this. And I'm going to go into a little bit of technical detail. And you might wonder, what's this got to do with UX design? But I think it has everything to do with UX design, because the technologies that are coming enable us to design for new types of experiences on the web. And this really needs to be a designer-developer partnership. And when I mention developer, I kind of mean all of the UX functions. 
Progressive Web Apps is a new term for new features and technologies of the modern web. Progressive Web Apps are enabled by a new set of capabilities that allow us as designers, in collaboration with developers, to radically improve that user experience that people have on the web. And we do this by making sure that that experience is fast. We want to make sure that the experience is better integrated with device hardware platforms. And we want to ensure that experiences are reliable. And we need to keep users engaged. So let's start with fast. Users don't expect janky scrolling or slow loading performance from a really good app. The web has a bad name for slow performance, particularly on mobile. And by performance, I mean in-page performance as well as load performance. Web app loading has to be invisible for your users. Just like with good native apps, web apps should really just work. Now, it takes a mobile web page on average 12 seconds to fully load on a 3G connection. And that experience is really bad for everyone. For every one second delay in page load time, conversions drop by 7%. So that's bad for our businesses. So we have to fix this. And also, one side effect of the reach of the web, unlike native apps, is that you can't dictate the starting point for any particular experience. You need to really carefully think about the performance of every single page. So we have to make sure that wherever someone starts, it's always a fast experience. Let's talk about integration. As well as speed, users expect app-like integration with their device hardware platform and other apps. You know that great feeling you get when you use a really well-made app, that tight connection right from the start that you want, the task you want to achieve? Um, you forget you're using an app, really. It's just such a tight, engaging experience. So people shouldn't really have to think about the fact that they're on the web, that they're using their phone, their tablet, or their laptop to complete a task. Now, in terms of integration, when your user visits your site, you can now prompt them to add that site to the home screen. A great example is from Trivago, a major travel site that launched their PWA for 55 different domains globally. And as you can see here, when you tap Add to Home Screen, this hits your screen immediately. And you can access that just like you would a native app. It's fast and it's simple. So now when it's added on your home screen, it's more integrated on your device. The then the, 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 um, it's displayed also in your app launcher, just like other apps. And it's part of your overall Android settings. Another user experience to design for that's now possible is push notifications from the web. So we've not really had that before. This example from Twitter, this is Twitter's progressive web app, illustrates push notifications um, and how they've integrated on their progressive web app experience. Of course, we need to be conscientious and mindful when we consider how to design such schedules. But this does provide now a way for businesses to re-engage people on the web, which hasn't existed before. And on the topic of integration, let's touch on new capabilities for integration for e-commerce. So digital commerce is such a huge deal. Last year, e-commerce was worth $2.304 trillion globally. Most e-commerce e -commerce accounted for, I'm sorry, mobile e-commerce e accounted for almost 60% of this, 58.9% of this. But it's still a really a big fundamental challenge for the mobile web, specifically. The web has gone mobile, but conversions on mobile are one third lower than on desktop. And it makes sense. It's hard to enter data on a phone. So we're doing as much as possible to you know, remove form experiences and everything else. We need better integration. E-commerce is all about removing friction. So browsers have worked to address this with autofill. And today on Chrome, over 9 billion forms and passwords are autofilled each month. That's really great, but it's not enough. So the Payment AP Request API goes a step further. It's a W3C standard for browsers that provides an interface to users to enter payment and shipping data. So users have this consistent experience, and developers don't have to reinvent the wheel from you know, your tiny boutique store to your big e-commerce giant. 
Now, sites can use the Payment Request API to get it, the experience that is shown here. And you can see that Chrome has securely stored email shipping and the credit card details for the user. The merchant gets all of this information in a simple form, already pre-populated. And now we're going further than this. Since convergence is so much lower on mobile, we need to fix that. So we've released a whole payment solution that companies use, Google Pay, and that's the product that I now work on. It enables fast, simple checkouts. It provides easy access to rewards and offers, and one spot for purchases and payment methods. Really, it's trying to do away with forms, so there's this one-click experience, and you know, a lot of the way we're getting users ready to pay is through autofill and getting credit cards into the cloud like that, so users across the board are ready to pay, even if it's the first time they've used your product. So you can see that the web has become an environment that is fit for the possibility of providing really great experiences. But users need better reliability as well. With progressive web apps, we make sure the experience always works, because when it doesn't work, or when it loads too slowly, it breaks the user experience and it destroys that user trust. So creating a reliable experience is really crucial. When a user taps on home screen icon, they expect it to load instantly and reliably. We've become used to always being online. And as much as I like this cute little fella, we don't really need to see him. I'd rather we didn't. So imagine getting a system-generated error message from your offline native app. That would seem crazy. So, and it's not just no connection that breaks the user experience. Slow and intermittent connections can be even worse. We call this Li-Fi. Okay? Even here in the Bay Area, believe it or not, there are areas with poor cell coverage. And there are people here in the US that have to use dial-up to get online. And worldwide, more than 60% of cell phones are on 2G. So likewise, broadband infrastructure is often poor. And as you see here, many people in the US don't have access to fast broadband, a similar picture in many other regions. Now, the, the news on this is it exists this new technology called Service Workers. Written in JavaScript, it's a client-side proxy that acts as an intermediary between your web app and the outside world. It can cache resources to ensure a reliable experience, no matter what the connection is like, because resources can be pulled directly from the cache instead of from the network. So your app can work even if there's no network connection. For us as UX professionals, this means we'll be designing for offline experiences. For the web, a whole new realm for us to explore is what can we achieve for our users, for our companies, when people are offline or in places with flaky network connections. These service workers are part of what's at the core of PWAs. They also enable the push notifications I mentioned earlier. Lastly, a truly engaging app experience needs to go beyond being functional and reliable and ensure that the whole experience is delightful and makes it easy for the user to do what they want. An engaging experience starts at the very beginning with a delightful first run experience, and it continues through all your user journeys and works perfectly without friction. So the, an engaging PWA uses the magic of the web. It's indexable, searchable, it's linkable and shareable. The experience is timely and relevant and precise because it counts for users' context and what matters to them right now. So making an app engaging ranges from basic experiences that are imperative to get right. And this includes asking for permissions only when you need it, not as soon as the app opens, and asking people to sign up and sign in at the right time when they're appropriately invested and there's something in it for them and not just for our businesses. And removing friction in forms. Many presentations have talked a lot about forms before. My colleague Luke Wibluski talks about it plenty. Um, but there's still plenty of poor experiences on the web. We actually did an audit this year of 400 top websites in Europe, and we found 42% of the sites from across 15 countries didn't show the appropriate keyboard for the input type. So obviously, that's friction. It's the best practice that's been out there for a long time. And 27% didn't show optional fields. There's a couple of problems with this. Users might be overwhelmed with the sheer number of you know, form fields they need to fill in. And they might struggle on one that's actually not applicable to them and eventually give up. 
So a lot of errors we see with forms can be overcome by the use of and the proper implementation of autofill. Now, it's critical to make sure you're following all of the best practices for web design, obviously, using the right input type and using features appropriately. And at Google, we've done some extensive usability studies to develop now, all in all, 75 principles um, that encapture the best practices on mobile. Uh, we, we did large studies on Android and iOS, um, and we looked at 250 different mobile sites and apps, and this led to all of these principles here. The second set in each of those that you see have additional links in it that go to code snippets and, and different resources for developers. And so those are ones you can pass on to uh, any developers you're working with, too. So making sure the user experience basics are good, as well as enabling delightful, perhaps personalized, context-dependent experiences makes a web app experience engaging. And at Google, we're working on creative, progressive web app experiences that scale. So Google Search uses a PWA to make sure it's possible for users to ask questions when they're offline, and then when they come back online, um, that it provides an answer once they've reconnected. That uses service workers and background sync and push notifications to let people know that that answer has now been found. By using service workers, they're able to reduce the number of external JavaScript requests by nearly 50%, and reduce the number of user interactions delayed by loading JavaScript by 6%. Bulletin is a new way to create and share hyperlocal stories, all built around a progressive web app. It's a tiny fraction of the size of a native app with 100% of the functionality. And they do some really neat stuff with media capture APIs to make it really easy for users to capture the moment. And sharing is as simple as sharing a URL. And the Maps team recently shipped a progressive web app themselves. They saw progressive web apps as a way to radically improve their experience for their users on low-end devices or when they're on flaky network connections. And it would be great if these improved experiences are available to users no matter what browser they use. If the browser supports it, and if developers can build on it, and designers can design for it, and this is becoming a reality. Service workers are now supported in essentially every modern browser, including Safari and Edge. <clears throat> and Apple shipped support for service workers in late March, and with the recent update to Edge, they're now supported there too. Browser vendors are adding support for all new kinds of capabilities that enhance the user experience. Edge also got push notifications and is doing some interesting stuff with their store. And Firefox has support for push notifications as well and is working on the new web authentication APIs. And Safari is also working on the web auth APIs as well. So that's the basics of progressive web apps. And it's exciting to see how these are transforming web user experience. Now let's take a look at one example of a progressive web app, this one from Starbucks. It takes advantage of many of the new capabilities and brings a modern web experience to their customers. It makes it easy to browse the menu, customize and place an order, or pay for an order in a store. So let's consider how that FIRE acronym, the fast, integrated, reliable, and engaging, applies to the Starbucks experience. So the Starbucks site loads fast, but it also feels really fast. And the way Starbucks does this is using placeholder content, like you see here, until the actual content is loaded. It's kind of, you know, most of the time the users don't notice it, but it really makes a difference to that perceived speed. It looks like things have started to load, and those gray placeholders are quickly replaced by the actual content. And on fast networks, when the content has already been pre-cached, users don't even see this, or they're not aware of it. Another aspect of the fast experience is navigating between pages. Navigations feel fast, and they are fast. It never feels to, like to the user that the page does a full kind of reload. Navigation shouldn't rely only on the network, but instead everything should be pre-cached and ready to go. To reduce the friction of signing in, Starbucks uses the Credential Management API, which makes signers as simple as one tap. And as you can see here, the Add to Home, home Screen prompt that you can see at the bottom, um, I can easily add it to my home screen and launcher. And soon, the Add to Home Screen banner is not going to show automatically anymore. Instead, we'll have to add a little bit of UI to our app to prompt the user. And when that happens, we need to be careful that we don't go and 
add, you know, anything like a full page into Stitle again, because nobody really likes those. So when the user adds your PWA to their home screen on Android, Chrome automatically generates the APK for you, which we sometimes call a web APK. Having a web APK means your app shows up in the app launcher. And in your settings, where you can see the amount of storage used, its permissions, and so forth. To make the experience reliable experience, the Starbucks PWA uses Workbox with a combination of pre-caching strategies. So it's caching a lot of this information and runtime caching strategies. By pre-caching that content, they can ensure that those key resources are always available and serve directly from the cache without having to wait for the network. Then, as the user uses the app, additional content is cached as they navigate around the app. So sometimes some of that content isn't cached until users go there. If they're then in a flaky network connection, they can get back to it. While placing an order offline is, of course, impossible, the Starbucks PWA makes it possible for a user to pay for um, an order in the store because they pre-cache the payment information. So it uses IndexedDB to save information on each menu item, store information, the user's Starbucks card, and more. So if I'm in perhaps a different country than I usually am and I haven't got a connection there, I can pay in this offline way. Starbucks focus on the user experience to make their progressive web app engaging. Placing an order has to be easy so that users can customize the drink with the many possible options available. They paid attention to fundamental details like the navigation stack, making sure that the back button always does the right thing, that it goes back step by step rather than jumping back to the home screen or some other random page. And to make the experience really feel alive, Starbucks use content-specific animations and messaging for the user. For example, after clicking Add to Order, it shows this toast here that it's added my order to my bank. So through creating this fast, integrated, reliable, and engaging experience, Starbucks have put their customers first to meet their needs where they are, to make it convenient and delightful for them to get their favorite drink. So this improved user experience has really paid off for Starbucks. They've got some wonderful data that the um, orders are growing 12% week over week. And because Starbucks took a responsive approach and made sure the experience works nicely on desktop, they're also seeing desktop users use the web app in order to order ahead so their drink is ready when they get there. We attribute many of the uh, progressions, I shouldn't use that word really, the, the evolution of progressive web apps very much to mobile, and mobile's been the key focus of progressive web apps. However, we're starting work on desktop, because desktop experience is still growing. It just has a different pattern in users' lives, whereas mobile and tablet are used in the morning and evening. It's used more often, like, more often distributed throughout the day, particularly because of the productivity tools we use at work. Users have really high expectations of desktop apps, and they also need to be fast, integrated, reliable, and engaging, so that they look and feel like other apps we're used to on desktop. So progressive web apps development is happening for Chrome, Mac, and Windows. And Windows users can already install desktop progressive web apps through the Microsoft App Store. So things are starting to merge like that. Um, so. If a team has created a mobile progressive web app, they don't have to do a great deal more work to create one for desktop. It works you know, reliably. We can use web push and notifications. The only real difference is instead of running in a browser tab, it runs in an app window. There are no tabs or address bar. It's just the app. It's oft optimized to support the needs of apps. So you can think about flexible window organization and manipulation. Uh, app windows make it really easy to unitask with the window in full screen or multitask with multiple screens. And it's really responsive design that matters here. Um, you can also do your app switching uh, with you know, your alt tab. That works well here, so that's a nice experience. Um, and you can have um, the title bar theme based on the theme color defined in the web app manifest, as you can see here. So different things you can do with the app menu there, the things that you'd expect, print the page, change the zoom level, open the app in the browser. 
and they have this large screen escape. So you can add additional breakpoints and really think about your responsive design here, whether that's for a full week's forecast or if you're going to move it down and then perhaps just have one day of weather, or if that was a music app, just you know, the, the button to move to the next song. So we can take that idea of progressive web apps and think about how we're going to support convertibles, like the Pixel Book or the Surface. So, you know, when we switch those to tablet mode, the devices make the active window full screen. And depending on how the user holds the device, that can be either landscape or portrait. And again, we need to think about this responsive design. So an app window opens up lots of new possibilities. So we need to take that responsive approach that adds new breakpoints for larger screens, supports landscape or portrait views, works when full screen or not, and nicely also works with virtual keyboards. And what's next? We're looking at support for Mac and Windows. We're looking at things like adding support for keyboard shortcuts, badging for the launch icon, the launch icon so users can be informed about important events that full notifications aren't needed for, and link capturing, opening installed PWAs when the user clicks on a link handled by the app. And so we'll be making more announcements about this on our Chromium blog, so take a look there for the new technologies coming out with that. So just to summarize, I wanted to take this time I have with you today to tell you all about progressive web apps, because in my experience, it's primarily developer communities that are talking about this. And I think it's really important for user experience and design professionals to get involved with this. We need to work with developers to determine what experience we can provide through that caching. We are the ones that are going to have some great ideas and do the research to understand what those offline experiences ought to be. There are all sorts of user journeys that can benefit from this, such as you know, browsing content when you're on underground transit and that kind of thing. So working together, designers and developers, and it's really exciting to consider how these transformations of the web will support the next use cases and user experiences we can design for. So that's what I've got for you today. Thank you so much for your time. You can contact me at this name on Twitter. Thanks a lot. <laughs>